Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth talk in the FY21 NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these seminars is to showcase NOAA's leadership in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. My name is Katie Rowley, Outreach Librarian from the NOAA Central Library, and I am your seminar co-host today. We have had an overwhelming response to this webinar. Over 1,300 people registered by 8 a.m. this morning. We have a limit of 1,000 webinar seats in Adobe Connect, so we needed another way for everyone to participate. So we are using Go Google Meet live stream for some NOAA folks who registered later, thanks to NOAA staff who logged in via Google Meet live stream. I would like to thank the NOAA Research Council who sponsors this webinar series and the team I work with in producing these seminars, without whom none of these talks could happen. Hernan Garcia with NOAA's National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, or NESDIS, Sandra Clark, also with NESDIS, and Tracy Gill with NOAA's National Ocean Service. Other NOAA staff join us each month to make these webinars happen. We'd like to thank the following people. Kel Bliss from OMAO, who will be fielding and processing the content questions and comments today. Mike Shelby and Rob Levy from the NOAA Studio jumped in to make the Google Meet live stream available for NOAA staff. And Benjamin Cajun Guthrie with the DUS office who created the Google Form for NOAA for the Q&A in the Google live stream event. And last but not least, thanks to the captioner for making this webinar more accessible. Here are a few seminar logistics. You can find all of them listed in the Q&A pod. Since we are exceeding our capacity in Adobe Connect, for this webinar, some are watching via Adobe Connect and others are watching through Google Live Stream. All attendees are muted. Adobe Connect attendees may post their questions and comments into the Q&A pod at any time. And if you are on a Google Live Stream, you may use the Google Form you were sent via email today. If you have questions about the Google Form, contact omao.pco at noaa.gov. Again, that is omao pco at noaa.gov. If you have technical issues with Adobe Connect, you can email tracy.gill at noaa.gov. If you have issues with the Google Live Stream event, email mike.shelby at noaa.gov or robert.levy at noaa.gov. If you have a phone, if you need a phone option for audio, email tracygill at noaa.gov and she will try and help. If your system seems to be lagging, please turn off any extra apps you might have running. We are recording this seminar, and it will be made available within a few days at the link provided in the chat box. Please note, as the recording and the Q&A chat will be available online, if you submit a question or comment in the chat box, your name representing your likeness will be recorded and shared you can visit the NOAA Environmental Leadership Series webpage at the link listed in the Q&A pod. There you can also find the recordings and PDFs of slides from past presentations. Now, today's seminar is titled The Biden-Harris Transition and the Year of the NOAA Workforce. And our speaker is Benjamin Freeman, NOAA's Deputy Undersecretary for Operations, performing the duties of Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and NOAA Administrator. Welcome, Mr. Freeman. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind of introduction. Uh, and welcome. Uh, welcome to NOAA employees. Welcome to our associates, our stakeholders, to members of the public who are participating in this today. I know there's a very wide audience. This is really a rare opportunity for me to be able to speak to such a wide audience. And I just want to thank the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar uh, for, for putting on this event. Uh, so let me start with the obvious. Uh, welcome to Shea Friedman. Uh, this is my attic. Uh, I sit up here to work because it is one of the few places in my house where I won't interfere with other people who are working or going to school in the house. Uh, like most of you, I've been working from my home from the last year. It has been a strange, sometimes surreal experience full of lots of challenges. And I do want to take a moment just to thank all the, the uh, NOAA workforce uh, who have made it work over the last year. It has not been easy. I know it has not been easy. And you, you've just shown incredible flexibility and resilience in keeping our mission going. It's amazing. 
uh, how much of our mission we've been able to keep, uh, keep going in this environment. And for those of you who are continuing to go in the office, and I know there's many of you, from weather forecasters to satellite operators to those on our ships and planes to those going into labs, I, I just want to give a heartfelt thanks to you. Uh, we lose sleep at night up at headquarters trying to figure out ways to make sure that you are safe. We're doing everything in our power to make sure you're safe. But we also fully recognize by going into a work environment right now, you're putting yourself at higher risk than those that are uh, of us that are staying at home. And so uh, a special thanks to you. I owe you a debt of gratitude as does NOAA and the entire nation. Uh, your mission critical roles that, that are important uh, to keeping important functions for this country going, and uh, just a, a huge thanks to you. Um, so you will notice uh, I am not speaking from a speech. I don't have a speech written out. Uh, I have no PowerPoint. I don't have pictures. Uh, and there's a, a, a purpose to this madness. Um, I feel like I'm already at a distance between me and the audience. Uh, because of this uh, virtual context. And so I didn't want to create further distance by having pictures or, or a PowerPoint. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me as I was thinking about this, look, I'm in my home, most of you are in your homes. So this is really in many ways just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a lot of different people. Uh, and I really do want this to be a conversation. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. Please start thinking about questions you want to ask. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about uh, the topics that I'm discussing today or NOAA other topics or anything else. If you want to talk about the upcoming NCAA tournament, that's fine too. Uh, so and no, no questions are really uh, uh, off limits, and I'll do my best to, to answer uh, anything I can. Um, so while I don't have a speech written out, I do have notes that, that I'm working from. And there is a construct uh, to the, this uh, presentation. And I thought I'd present this uh, like kind of like a book. Uh, and so there's a preface. That's what I'm doing now where I'm talking about what I'm going to talk about. There's four chapters to this presentation and then an epilogue uh, or prologue. Uh, the, the four chapters, um, the first is where I'm going to talk a little bit about NOAA and what we do and a way of thinking about our mission. Uh, the second is to tell you a little bit about myself and my background. Uh, and that's, I'm sorry, that's part one and part two of the first chapter. Chapter two will then turn to a focus on the transition to the Biden administration and the priorities uh, of the Biden administration. Chapter three, we're going to tur turn to uh, uh, a discussion of the workforce and what we are affectionately calling at NOAA headquarters uh, the year of the work workforce. And this is a series of issues that we're working with to really try to improve things uh, for our workforce around the country. It includes diversity and inclusion. It, it includes uh, workplace violence prevention. And an issue that I know a lot of people are very interested in uh, post-COVID work, uh, what is the workforce going to look like when we finally return to our offices? Uh, the prologue will be uh, the, the question and answer phase uh, that, that I already mentioned. So again, start, start thinking of your questions now. So without further ado, uh, why don't we move to chapter one? So chapter one, part one, is where I talk about NOAA and what we do. So. Uh, I recognize that most of you work at NOAA, so you may be asking, hey, uh, why do you need, I need to hear about NOAA? Uh, I already know what NOAA does. Um, well, let me say this. Uh, I've been at NOAA for over a decade. I've been in my current role as the Deputy Undersecretary for Operations for, for around five years. This is my second stint as the Acting Administrator of NOAA. And uh, I will tell you that I still learn new things about NOAA constantly. Uh, it is amazing the scope of our mission and how far it reaches. And uh, so there's always more to learn about NOAA. Second of all, we have a lot of guests on the line here today. We have stakeholders and members of the public who may not be as familiar with our mission. So I wanted to uh, talk about our mission with them. And third, I also wanted to kind of put a focus on our mission and talk about a way of thinking about, a, a, about our mission that maybe you haven't thought about before. So first, uh, about NOAA. 
So let me start by saying uh, I firmly believe in, in a very unbiased way that NOAA is the coolest agency in all of government. Uh, we like to say that our mission takes us uh, from the surface of the sun to the bottom of the ocean, and that is really true. Uh, we literally have a satellite of a Discover that sits about a million miles outside of Earth's atmosphere. It sits between us and the sun, and it stares at the sun looking at emanations off the sun, something we call space weather that could impact electrical grids and other electronics on, on Earth. And on the other end of the spectrum, we do deep sea exploration. We have a ship, the Okeanos Explorer, that's ported out of Rhode Island, uh, that has a deep sea exploration uh, mission and uh, charts on previously on un, un, uh, charted parts of the ocean uh, and, and explores the, the ocean floor. And we do everything in between. Uh, we do atmospheric sciences, climate sciences, of course, weather and weather sciences. And we do all things ocean, whether it's regulating fisheries, protecting endangered species uh, in the ocean, tracking uh, sea level rise, and the oldest part of our mission, the Office of Coast Survey, which goes back to the days of Thomas Jefferson, uh, tracking and, and surveying the coasts of the United States uh, and, and the, the seafloor bottom. We have unbelievable resources to, to do our work. Uh, there are around 12,000 full-time employees at NOAA. We have another 10,000 plus contractors, so well over uh, 20,000 people in our workforce. Uh, we have approximately 700 occupied facilities across the country. Obviously, we're in every territory uh, and, and state in, in the country. Uh, more often than not, we're in multiple places in every state and territory in the country. Um, along with those 700 occupied facilities, we have around 2,000 sites uh, that we own or lease for scientific instruments and observational platforms. Uh, we operate 16 satellites. Uh, they're weather satellites and environmental satellites. We have 15 ships and another 400 or so small boats, although these really aren't that small. Some of them are 50 foot plus, but we call them small boats because they're, they're not as big as our, our ships. Uh, we have 10 airplanes, including the most famous ones, uh, the hurricane hunters that fly into the eyes of a, of a hurricane to collect dur uh, data dur during hurricanes, but it's essential for hurricane forecasting. Um, we have 11 labs, world-class labs across the country, and 15 cooperative institutes. These are uh, connections with uh, some of the top universities in the country that support us uh, in our science. Um, we have major computing systems and infrastructure within NOAA, some of the biggest supercomputers in the country, and we have the best weather and climate models in the world. Our operating budget, uh, we get about $5.5 billion a year from Congress, and uh, to some that may sound like a lot, but uh, it's really very small when you consider our impact on this country. We impact fully one-third of the U.S. GDP. Um, so there are some people out there that like to separate NOAA into a wet side and a dry side, uh, the wet side being our fishery service and our ocean service, uh, the dry side being our weather service and our satellite service, and then we have a, a research uh, division and an office of marine and aviation operations that support all these functions. Um, I'm going to say right here, right now, uh, that we're going to stop that vernacular. There is no wet side and dry side of NOAA. There is one NOAA. We all work together. If the last decade of research has shown anything, it's that the, the connection between weather, climate, and water is inextricably, inextricably linked. There's no way to talk about one without the other. They all impact each other. And yes, that means weather service, you are part of the fishery service. And fishery service, you're part of the satellite service. And satellite service, you're part of the ocean service. And research and, and uh, marine and aviation operations, you're supporting us all. We are one NOAA. And if you're looking for one mission, one mission set to connect us all, it's simply this, probably the greatest existential crisis that humankind has ever faced in climate change. We uh, are obviously at the center of the climate change conversation. We do a lot in this arena. Climate change is impacting everything we do at NOAA. It's impacting everything we do in this country and everything we do in the world. Uh, and it's just within NOAA, as a few examples, 
within fisheries. We're seeing uh, huge impacts to fishery migration and fishery uh, habitat. Uh, endangered species are being impacted in ways we've never seen before. Just go back a couple of weeks to the, the cold, stunning event of turtles in Texas at a scale never seen before. Over 10,000 turtles impacted. And NOAA was on the ground with our partners trying to save those turtles, something we've never seen before. And in the Ocean Service, we're seeing unprecedented, unprecedented sea level rise and coastal inundation and flooding. Uh, in the Weather Service, last year, we had 22 significant weather events. And we defined those as having uh, an impact of a billion dollars or more on the U.S. economy. 22 events last year. The previous record was 16. And over the last 40 years, we average seven. So that gives you some sense of what climate change uh, is doing to this country and the impact it's having. Climate change is really our super app. It's the thing that brings NOAA all together as one. And uh, when we think about climate change, I wanted to, to kind of come up with a new construct of thinking about uh, climate change. And this is something that I did not invent, one of my colleagues invented, but uh, I like it and so I'm going to promote it here. And it's really the four Ps. Uh, when it comes to climate change, uh, climate change, we predict, we prepare, we protect, and we preserve. We predict how our actions are today are going to impact uh, tomorrow. We do that through forecasting and modeling. I've already mentioned that we have incredible models with the NOAA. This is weather, this is climate, but it's also fish and predicting fish and endangered species and, and what the impact of them will be. We prepare. We prepare our communities to meet the challenges of these predictions. Again, weather, climate, coastal resilience, these are all things we do with the NOAA to prepare communities around the country for the impacts of climate change. We protect. We protect uh, the nation from danger, from severe weather and events. Uh, and we protect, um, you know, coasts and estuaries uh, and, and, and uh, all the communities that are along uh, the coast. And we preserve. We preserve uh, the, the, the natural uh, environment and uh, uh, the, the fisheries, the uh, um, endangered species, the, the nation's uh, uh, jewels in the National Marine Sanctuary Program. And, and uh, estuaries. Uh, we, we preserve these so that the future uh, can, can have them as well. So uh, again, a new construct of thinking about what we do as we affect climate change. And when we talk about climate change, let me just say this, that you know, I have traveled um, across this country. I have met with hundreds of you uh, in all line and staff offices. And if there's one thing I know, it's this. We got this. We got this. Uh, I have never been more impressed by a group of individuals in my life. We have world-class scientists that are looking at these issues in creative ways. Given the resources, we can help. We can solve this problem, and we will be a central part of this discussion. And I want to send that message loud and clear. Uh, we got this. And Noah, I have complete faith in, in your ability. OK, moving on to Chapter 1, Part 2. This is where I talk a little bit about myself. And I'm not going to talk a lot about myself. I'm going to focus on two areas. Uh, and I'm doing this um, because, uh, and not just to talk about myself, because it actually has an influence and an impact on discussions in Chapters uh, uh, 2, 3, and 4. Um, so the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is, uh, if you look at my background, you know, you'll notice that I have an undergraduate degree in molecular biology. Uh, I have a master's in theological studies. And I have a law degree. And people look at that and they say, how does that possibly make sense? How do you put all these things together? And I'll tell you, at least in my mind, it's pretty simple. Uh, my dad was a molecular biology professor at Vanderbilt University. Uh, he had an MD-PhD. Um, I'm talking about him as if he's in the past tense. He's not in the past tense. He's 84 years old and he's still working. He is a scientist, though, through and through. Uh, my mother, who's also still alive, although not working, 
uh, is uh, with an art historian who worked on uh, worked in some major museums, uh, particularly in the New York City area. And I always felt like I was somewhere in between. Uh, it's almost embarrassing to to say this, uh, to mention this, um, but you know, back when I was applying to colleges, my college essay was on this issue. Uh, I I will tell you, I'll be perfectly honest here. When I was writing it, I don't know if I really believed it at the time, uh, but I wrote on how I was split between science and the arts, uh, and uh, it turned out to be very prescient because it's really been true, and that's what I've noticed uh, throughout my career. Uh, and the arts part, I think, is is really a focus on people uh, and and how they respond. And and I tell you all this because this is how I approach the job. Uh, both internally and externally to NOAA. When I think about internal to NOAA, I, I, yes, I love the science. I love hearing about the science. But I'm really focused on the people, making sure our people are safe and accepted and uh, are in a good environment and have the resources they need to do the job. And externally, it's the same way. Uh, our science is amazing, and I love talking about our science. But it's only science uh, as it impacts people and places and the world. That's what's important to me. So that dichotomy between me that you may see in my background, I, I, I bring that to the table, and that is how I view my job uh, in this position right now. So um, the second thing I will tell you uh, about myself is that uh, I'm a full-time federal employee. I've been in the federal service for coming on 28 years. I started uh, in the judicial branch, uh, working for a judge. I spent many years at the Department of Justice, and then over the last decade plus, I've been at NOAA in the Department of Commerce. I'll also tell you, my wife is a, a full-time federal employee with over 28 years of experience, uh, split between the Department of Transportation and the Department of Homeland Security. So between us, we have almost 60 years of federal service. And trust me when I tell you, we've seen it all. We have had good bosses good bosses and bad bosses. We've had seen good work environments and bad work environments. We've had short commutes and long commutes. Unfortunately, we have seen sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace. Uh, we have raised two children in this environment and faced all the challenges that uh, federal employees face with working challenges. There's been times when I've had to step into lower positions so that I can leave at 5 o'clock and go pick up my kids from daycare so I wouldn't get charged. $20 a minute or whatever it was being, it was at the time, uh, we have faced so much. And when I look around at other NOAA leadership, it's all similar. The AAs, DAAs, uh, staff office directors, the folks that, that lead this organization, almost all of them are, are, have been career federal employees their entire lives. And I tell you this because it's important to understand how we come to the job our viewpoint when we come to this job, our viewpoint when we start talking about uh, new priorities and new administrations, and really, more, most importantly, when we start talking about workforce issues. We are you. We understand. We feel the same things, and we want the same things. Sometimes it feels like there's a disconnect between us uh, and, and uh, those out there uh, in, in the NOAA workforce particularly maybe those that are away from headquarters. But again, I've worked in satellite offices. My wife has. Uh, many of the, of the uh, folks here in leadership positions at headquarters have. We understand those issues, and, and we're trying to do everything we can uh, to make the right decisions for the entire world. Okay. Uh, I think that brings us to chapter two. So chapter two is where I talk about uh, the change in administration and the Biden priorities. Uh, so let me say that um, you know any change in administration, uh, there is a shift in tone, there is a shift in people, and there is a shift in priorities. We certainly saw it in uh, the difference between the Obama administration and the Trump administration, and we're seeing it again now. The last administration had a lot of good initiatives and many of those initiatives will continue into this administration. And many of us uh, uh, got to know the, the last political team well, 
And uh, in my experience, all prior political teams are part of the NOAA family, and this past team will be no exception. We will continue to see and hear from them. But we do have a new administration in place, and they're bringing a whole new energy and a whole new set of priorities. Starting with the people. Um, of course, NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce, and I'm sure many of you saw that yesterday a new Secretary of Commerce was confirmed. Secretary Raimondo, uh, uh, Raimondo was confirmed, uh, and uh, prior to yesterday, she was the governor of Rhode Island. Now, the nice thing is, the Ro Rhode Island is the ocean state. So obviously, we have a lot of connections with, Governor, uh, with Secretary Raimondo. Uh, even before she was nominated to be secretary, she had a lot of interest in DOA. We have a lot of assets uh, within Rhode Island. She had previously met with uh, Louis Uccellini, the head of the Weather Service, on weather issues in Rhode Island, even before she was nominated. And since being nominated, she's shown a deep interest in, in NOAA and our mission. We are going to be one of the first ones she meets with, meets with in the coming days, and there will be more to follow with her contacts with NOAA in the near future. Uh, within NOAA, uh, we have up to 15 political appointees, typically within NOAA. Three of those are Senate components. Senate confirmed positions, a administrator, and two assistant secretaries. We do not have those positions filled yet. We currently have four positions filled um, at the political level. We have a chief of staff, Karen Hyun, uh, who uh, Dr. Hyun is coming to us from the Audubon Society. Uh, Walker Smith is our new general counselor, who has an extensive federal career at the Department of Justice and EPA. Uh, Latisse Lapierre. Uh, is uh, a very experienced uh, 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 doctor who uh, previously is uh, coming to us from the Resource Legacy Fund, and she, she's a senior advisor within NOAA. And Emily McCullough is coming to us from the Hill as, as a special assistant. And while there are only four of them, they are working extraordinarily hard. And I will tell you that they are bringing in an enthusiasm and excitement to NOAA that, that I've really seen, and it's been just wonderful to work with them. They've been great partners, and they're very, very keen on uh, working with the federal workforce closely. Um, as to priorities, um, uh, a lot of the priorities I'm sure you've seen, a lot of them have been very public, and there's been executive orders issued on them. I'm going to talk about a handful of them here, uh, climate change, racial equity, scientific integrity, COVID, and morale. So starting with climate change, I've already discussed uh, the impact of climate change on NOAA, and obviously we're a big part of this conversation. There have been two executive or, uh, uh, orders issued on climate change. Uh, the, the first basically requires us to look past uh, at the past few years and determine if uh, all our new regulations and policies basically are environmental friendly. So we're in the process of doing that. The second creates a national federal task force to deal with climate change across all agencies, and Commerce and NOAA will clearly be a significant part of that. I can also tell you that we have friends in high places on this issue. Uh, at OSTP, which is the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, um, the new director that was recently named is Dr. Jane Lepchenko, who is the former NOAA administrator. So we know we have a voice at, at the White House on climate. And we have been actively talking to other agencies, the department, and White House uh, on climate issues. And again, we fully expect to be a central part of this conversation. OK, on racial equity. Racial equity is another uh, very, very high priority for this administration. There's basically two parts of racial equity uh, that I'm going to discuss. The first is internal to NOAA. That's really diversity and inclusion programs. I'm going to talk, I'm going to leave that conversation to the next chapter where we talk about workforce issues. Uh, the second piece is external to NOAA, how our services are provided in a racially and socially equitable way across the country. There's a new executive order on this uh, that basically requires us to identify programs and policies uh, that may fit into this racial equity uh, context. Um, we have a working group within NOAA that is working, that is uh, being headed by Latisse Lafier um, to, to start to identify those projects and policies. And we are uh, partnering with the Department of Commerce, who is collecting these across all of Commerce to submit to the White House. 
And uh, once we identify these areas, uh, the executive order requires us to come up with basically uh, an action plan to deal with how we're going to do better in these areas. There's a lot of excitement around this uh, to make sure that particularly our climate and weather and um, uh, 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 ocean uh, 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 services are provided to all communities across the country in an equal way, particularly those that have historically been underrepresented. And I can tell you just in conversations with the political team at NOAA and the department, uh, it's, it's pretty rare when racial equity doesn't, uh, isn't part of, at least part of the conversation. Okay, uh, next issue, scientific integrity. Um, so scientific integrity uh, is a major issue for NOAA, and it's a major issue for the administration. The administration has already issued a memo on scientific integrity. They're going to be reviewing the, the policies on scientific integrity across government. Now, uh, on scientific integrity, let me say this. Um, uh, as all of you probably know, we have had in the last couple of years accusations of scientific integrity issues within NOAA uh, out of Sharpie Gate, what's affectionately called Sharpie Gate, uh, the, 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 the Hurricane Dorian incident uh, and its aftermath. Without going into a lot of details, because they're all online, you can read them, I will tell you this, that we took this extraordinarily seriously within NOAA. We realize it impacts our workforce and everything we do. We have over 6,000 scientists in NOAA. We are a scientific organization, and scientific integrity is key to what we do. The public has to trust our science, and if they don't, uh, it's a real existential threat to, to, to NOAA. So we did two independent studies out of Hurricane Dorian. One was uh, out of our scientific integrity policy uh, that has a method for doing internal inquiries. We actually farmed this out to NAPA uh, to, to do, and they came back with a, a report that's been published. Uh, the second a review was done by the Inspector General of the Department of Commerce, who did a full review of the events of Hurricane Dorian and its aftermath, uh, and published a, a uh, comprehensive report on what happened. There were scientific integrity violations that occurred. Uh, there was uh, political, uh, potential political interference in our science. We are doing everything we can to address the situation. Within NOAA, we already had a strong scientific in po integrity policy, and we have tweaked it in some ways based on these reviews. We're also wor currently working with the Department of Commerce to get a Department of Commerce-wide scientific integrity policy. The new political team is completely on board with this and is excited to start putting this forward. And we've been reaching out to other agencies and the White House to make sure that in the future, Science is science, and federal science is trusted. Okay, moving to COVID. Um, obviously, this is a, a huge issue for the government workforce. There is an executive order on COVID as well. We have largely been in compliance uh, with that executive order already. We have been doing everything uh, at, at, at NOAA to make sure we are taking a scientific data-driven approach to COVID, doing uh, you know, everything in our power to keep our folks safe, um, and uh, that will continue. I did, uh, and you, you probably saw, there was an email that went out last week on wearing uh, face masks in public buildings and in, uh, on public land. Um, this is out of the executive order. We, again, we were largely in compliance to that, um, but uh, between that and the social distancing, and the PPE that we've distributed, and the signage, and the training, and everything else we've done with NOAA, uh, I'm, I'm confident that, that we're doing everything in our power uh, to keep our folks safe. And I apologize, it appears uh, every few minutes my screen is automatically going off, so I'll, I'll try to fix that. Um, okay, finally, uh, on uh, Biden initiatives, uh, the morale of the federal work. This has been a key part of the, the Biden administration. Uh, let's be honest, the, the federal workforce, I mean, we've all been there. Uh, as, as I've said, I'm a life, life longer here in the federal workforce. But we've taken it on the chin uh, uh, over the last, really, uh, you know, many, many years, uh, the last um, several administrations. Uh, Biden has come in with a real effort to improve morale within the federal workforce. 
And if you didn't have an opportunity to see his first aid meds in the federal workforce, it was issued to everyone. But if you haven't had an opportunity to see it, please do. It's great. I can tell you I've never seen anything like it. It, was, it, was, uh, it moved a lot of us, uh, you know, within the leadership of NOAA, we were talking about it. It's a great message, and it's really indicative of how serious this administration is taking morale. Uh, it is a, a constant conversation among the political teams at NOAA and the department. I've met with uh, multiple people on this. They really do want to make sure um, that uh, the, the federal workforce uh, is, is a place uh, that is inclusive, that, that people want to be a part of. Okay, and I think that's a very good segue into Chapter 3. So Chapter 3 is where I talk about workforce issues and what we are affectionately calling uh, at headquarters the Year of the NOAA Workforce. Now, the Year of the NOAA Workforce, um, really it, it's focused on the NOAA Workforce and improving conditions for the NOAA Workforce. And the ultimate goals are really pretty simple. We want to create a workforce where everyone uh, is accepted, is included, is part of the conversation, uh, knows they can be heard. We want to create an environment where people want to go into work, where they're excited to go into work. And the, the place that, like I said, coming from the federal workforce, I know, like the place that we all want to be at, where we, where we love our jobs and we love the people we work so uh, we realized um, uh, during, in some of our executive panel discussions that we were talking about a whole variety of workforce issues, diversity and inclusion issues, workplace violence issues, and how we're going to deal with the post-COVID workforce. Um, and uh, it just occurred to us, let's wrap this all up into this concept of the year of the for workforce and really focus on this issue, focus on improving conditions for the federal workforce within NOAA. So we'll start uh, with diversity and inclusion. Um, so obviously with uh, last year's social unrest, diversity and inclusion has been a hot topic, not just around NOAA, but around the country. I will tell you that diversity and inclusion has been a priority of mine and much of leadership for years now. It, it predated the social unrest, but the social unrest really focused us in a new way. Uh, and, and I think we need to start with the basic question. Why? Why, why do we re actually care about diversity? And when I talk about this, I talk about uh, three, three things. The first is study after study after study has shown that diversity improves organizations. It improves decision making. It makes them stronger. And if you ask why, the answer is actually pretty simple because we are all human, uh, limited in our humanness. We are all limited by our experiences, and we all have blinders on in certain ways. And so when it comes to decision-making, we rely on our own experiences and our own background, and sometimes we don't see all parts of a problem or an issue by our own limitations. But when you put multiple people in a room with multiple backgrounds and great diversity, uh, you take a lot of those blinders off because people have different experiences and are asking different questions and viewing issues and problems in a different way. So diversity in and of itself makes organizations stronger, and that's something that's been accepted uh, in the social science communities for, for quite some time now. So that's number one. Number two is particularly for NOAA. We provide services to this country, including emergency services, certainly in weather, uh, in, in postal issues, uh, and it, it is critical for us to look like the nation if we are going to provide these services to the nation. How do we understand communities, uh, and particularly underrepresented communities across the country, if we have, don't have those within the workforce who understand what they are going through? So in particular for NOAA, it is important for us to have diversity and to look like the American public. Finally, uh, and maybe most importantly, it's simply the right thing to do. It's simply the right thing to do, and we all know it. You know, putting on my old uh, Masters of Theological Studies hat, there was a philosopher named William Butler who used to say, when you had a difficult problem, we have an ethical uh, compass within all of us. And if you go sit under a tree and re reflect, you will come up with the right decision. And I think all of us uh, going and reflecting under, under a tree on diversity and inclusion know 
that improving the diversity and inclusiveness within NOAA is the right thing to do. So what are we doing with diversity and inclusion? Well, like I said, out of the recent social unrest, we took a very aggressive stance within NOAA. And I will tell you that comparing us to other agencies, uh, certainly within the bureaus within the Department of Commerce, but across other agencies, we're taking one of the most aggressive stances that there are. We did less listening sessions across NOAA at the most senior levels. Uh, we did surveys of all NOAA employees to get input from them. We created a working group of senior leaders and others to, to look at this issue and come up with recommendations for how we could improve. We've consulted with experts and other agencies about what we can do in this area. And we have come up with an action plan, an action plan for how to improve diversity and inclusion within NOAA. This is something that's going to be shared with the workforce very soon. I apologize it hasn't gotten out sooner, uh, but uh, we've been working hard on it, and we expect it to come out in, in the very uh, near term. Uh, but let me kind of go through how what the action plan looks like. The first thing uh, to understand with the action plan is it has three different categories. Uh, there's near-term actions, there's mid-term actions, and there's long-term actions because we recognized we couldn't do everything at once. And so we needed a way to focus our attention on the actions that are most immediate and those that are longer term. Each action is assigned to a line of staff office as the lead and uh, individuals within each line and staff offices to be responsible for implementing these actions. Uh, and we have metrics associated with each action as well to test to see how we're doing, how we're performing, if we are meeting our desired outcome. So let me give you just a sense, and I'm just going to read some of these, of uh, some of the actions in the uh, near-term, mid-term, and long-term action plan. So uh, short-term, um, using diverse hiring panels uh, when, when we hire employees, training for all managers and employees in diversity and inclusion, maximizing the use of direct hire. We have new great legislative authorities that allow us to hire outside of the competitive process, particularly uh, with a lot of our partners and those doing internships uh, uh, at, at NOAA, uh, and we're trying to utilize those uh, more appropriately to improve diversity. Um, promoting our employee resource groups and our diversity councils with NOAA, and approving a transgender policy, which is another policy that should come out very shortly within NOAA. So these are some of the short-term items. There's others. I'm not going to tell you the complete list. It's too long. But these are some of the things we're looking at addressing immediately. By March 15th, the line and staff offices uh, are have implementation plans due to us, and we're moving forward aggressively to start implementing these. Uh, on the midterm um, list, uh, inc it, it, these include increasing engagement in student outreach programs, uh, particularly targeting underrepresented groups, uh, reviewing all our job announcements to make sure that there's appropriate uh, gender neutral and racial neutral language in our job announcements, uh, increasing opportunities for underrepresented uh, groups within NOAA in the leadership uh, 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 segment, um, improving our onboarding uh, orientation program to make sure that diversity and inclusion is an important part of that, uh, and putting uh, diversity and inclusion issues in every manager's performance plan. So those are the midterm actions that we'll be taking up after, after we address the, the immediate actions. And then finally, some of the long-term actions we're looking at. Um, expanding paid internship programs. We, we uh, provide a lot of internship programs within NOAA. Many of them are unpaid. And what we started to realize is that there are a lot of people who can't afford to participate in unpaid internship programs. And uh, so we need to improve our paid internship programs to, to, so that everyone can participate. Um, expanding internships in STEM fields from underrepresented groups. Uh, which goes hand in hand in working and doing outreach uh, in education to uh, underrepresented communities. And finally, um, focusing on diversity and inclusion as we start talking about our facility footprint and where we might build new facilities. So those are some items on the long-term plan that we're thinking about and, and are going to uh, start moving towards implementing as we work through this process. 
Um, I can tell you that I am fully committed to this. Anybody who's heard me speak on this knows that I personally feel very strongly on this. It's a passion of mine, and it is uh, something that throughout NOAA leadership that we are completely on board with, and you have my, my absolute commitment that we are going to work and do everything we can to improve diversity and inclusion within NOAA. Okay, uh, I'm now going to work move to workplace violence prevention, and let me say um, that that these three areas, uh, uh, diversity and inclusion, workplace violence, and the future of NOAA's workforce, they all go hand in hand. They're all intertwined. There's no way to talk about one without the other. We we realize that. Um, there's oh, there's definitely overlap. Um, so first of all, the history of of uh, workplace violence issues within NOAA. Um, this uh, started actually with sexual assault, sexual harassment claims off of our ships about five or six years ago. Initially, we still thought this was an isolated problem, and we were focusing on our ships, and we put in some immediate, action, immediate actions to address that. But in that, we realized that this became a larger problem. We started working with Congress, uh, who passed legislation mandating certain things that with regards to sexual assault and sexual harassment within NOAA. We have gone way beyond what the legislation requires. And at this point, uh, we are addressing these issues and broader workplace violence issues throughout the organization. Let me also say that this is not isolated to NOAA. I have, as I said, worked at the Department of Justice. My wife has worked at DOT and, and Homeland Security. These issues are everywhere. We've gotten some attention on this, but we know they're everywhere. We don't care. We are going to be the leader in this. We are the leader in this. Let me just describe some of what we've done. Uh, we have hired a director for workplace violence, Kelly Bonner, who is amazing. I'm sure you, many of you have heard of her and heard from her before. She now has a director. And we've hired victim advocates to be placed around the country so that we can start dealing with uh, workplace violence issues throughout the entire organization. Uh, we have re had mandatory training in the last year. And this is going to be annual training for all employees on these issues. We had a wellness summit in the last couple of months uh, that was available to all NOAA employees to deal with wellness and hostility issues. We have an upcoming survey that's going to be provided to all NOAA on this and diversity and inclusion issues that is going to survey all employees to get a baseline of where we are and where we need to go. We have a helpline established uh, to help those in need and to report incidents. We've improved our investigation processes for sexual assault and sexual harassment, and we're working to continue those efforts to speed up our investigation process. We have a new sexual assault and sexual harassment policy uh, that's very aggressive, and we're working to tweak it even now. And we're partnering with uh, some of the top experts in the field in this area who are as consults, and we are quickly being seen, particularly in the science arena, as one of the leaders in this area. So as we talk about these issues, uh, we are expanding beyond sexual assault and sexual harassment. I fully recognize that, that workplace violence isn't just limited to sexual assault, sexual harassment. It involve, also involves domestic violence issues that can happen in the workplace. And all harassment and bullying and hazing type activity in the workplace. We've all seen it. We've all, many of us have experienced it. And it's intolerable. And so uh, the workplace violence, violence group, through their victim advocates, are going to be addressing some of these issues out in the field and in headquarters as well. Again, we are trying to create an environment where uh, people want to go into work. I personally have experienced it. My wife has experienced it. Uh, that type of behavior, it kills productivity. Uh, it makes a miserable work environment. And we're going to do everything we can to root it out. Um, uh, I'll just say that uh, you know working is hard enough, and, and you know creating a workplace that everyone wants to be a part of is really our goal. Okay, finally, uh, I'm going to uh, talk now about post post COVID workplace issues. And I know this is a topic that a lot of people are very interested interested in. Um, let me first state the obvious, recognizing that we have been operating for the last year primarily in a virtual setting. We've been hitting a lot of our mission goals, but not all of them. Uh, there have been uh, some real impacts uh, to, to our mission. That said, we have been remarkably productive. 
And everyone is now recognizing that there's a lot of things we can do virtually that we didn't think we could do before. This, I will tell you, is a super exciting conversation for me. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change the way we work. And uh, I personally, uh, you know, think that there are advantages to those at headquarters in the field uh, for this. There's all sorts of positives that can come out of this. Um, increasing work pro uh, workplace production and satisfaction, uh, increasing retention of our workforce, decreasing commute time, increasing recruiting opportunities so that we can recruit diversity and some of the top people who maybe can't move across the country to work with us. Um, showing environmental responsibility. Uh, if we can reduce our facilities because we don't have as many people going into them, obviously we're going to re reduce our carbon footprint. And if we have less people commuting into work, uh, we're going to be doing that as well. And we should be the leaders in this arena. And so that's an exciting uh, thing to consider as well. And it's also an opportunity to potentially invest in our workforce, taking some of the savings we get uh, from maybe not having as much workspace uh, available and pouring that back into our workforce to have training, travel, uh, to conferences and other activities um, to uh, improve uh, new technologies and collaboration tools uh, while we move to, to uh, potentially a, a new way of doing business. All that said, there are some cautions here. Uh, and, and I would tell you, we've been talking to experts, we've been talking to uh, other agencies, NASA is very focused on this, we've been talking to them. The Patent and Trademark Office, one of our sister viewers at NOAA is very focused on this, uh, and within commerce, is uh, very focused on this. They are actually the world leaders in this. They, they have about half their workforce teleworks full time from anywhere in the uh, country, remote working. They have a certain type of work that allows for that. But they are the experts, and we've brought them in as consultants, and they've been uh, fabulous partners. So there are downsides to this as well. Potential decrease in collaboration, increase in isolation. You know, sometimes, uh, particularly as people want to move up in an organization, not having face time, particularly with leadership, could be an issue. And performance issues. How do we test performance and make sure that we're as productive in this environment? So these are all issues that we're looking at. Uh, looking at. We put together a working group to work on this issue. Uh, they are reaching out to uh, also, uh, or if they haven't yet, or they're starting to, and they're going to continue working out, reaching out to unions and uh, other employee groups uh, to talk to them about this as well. Um, just so you know, I mean, we expect to create a policy at headquarters that is going to create, create a lot of new flexibility, a potential for extended telework or remote working. Uh, things like that. It will come probably with other things like hoteling more if people aren't coming into the office as much uh, and trying to figure out our workspaces. Um, but I, I do want to put it out a, a, a note of caution. We are going to be creating policies at headquarters, but it's going to be the line and staff offices that have to implement. We have such a wide mission. We work on ships and planes, in labs. We have weather forecasters and satellite operators. There is a large parts of our workforce that have to be on the ground in the office working. And uh, so there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. Uh, and we have to be cautious as we move forward that we are hitting metrics. We are hitting product production metrics. And so we're trying to create a process so that we can track as we go along. So we're moving forward with some of this. We're very excited about it. We know there's a timeline because in the next few months, uh, it is likely with vaccines, there will be more opportunities to go back into the office. Uh, but uh, and, and there's more to come on this. Um, I will say just very quickly before I move to Chapter 4 that uh, pending uh, the outcome of this, we are going to continue in our status quo. Uh, you'll get more guidance. There are working groups at the department level working on uh, uh, getting back into offices. We're starting to look at a whole variety of issues there. Um, but we're not there yet. And for the foreseeable future, we're going to keep the status quo. OK, finally, chapter four, I concluded. And I promise you this will be brief, because I know I've been talking for a long time. Um, OK, uh, let me just say this, that uh, we are facing more challenges than ever before. Uh, between climate change, uh, obviously is huge, COVID, uh, dealing with racial inequity and pass, uh, correcting past 
strong, these are enormous issues and there are huge challenges. But I cannot tell you how excited I am to be facing this with you. We have an opportunity to literally help save the planet. We have an opportunity to correct past wrongs in the way we produce services and the way we hire, recruit, and retain individuals. And we have an opportunity to change the workforce in a way that we've never seen before. So there are great challenges, but there's so much excitement. The political team is on board. The Biden administration is on board. We have a lot of support for this, and I couldn't be more excited. So let's get to work. And with that, thank you, and I'd love to hear your questions. We have quite a few questions. So let's start with, uh, how are you going to deal with supervisors who do not support increased telework post-COVID? Okay, good, very good question. And, and let me say this too. I think we had originally said three to four. We can go long, a little bit longer. I think actually they initially was to 415. So for those who want to ask questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. So um, that's a good question. And that's part of what the working group has to work on. We fully recognize and we've heard from staff members that there are, uh, there are supervisors out there that are not keen on creating new flexibilities. Uh, they like the way things were. They don't like the idea of creating uh, new ways of doing things. And we want to ensure that there's consistency across the board. In fact, we're currently reviewing every position description within NOAA, and there are a lot of them. But we're reviewing every single one to make sure we're crystal uh, consistent across how we approach these issues in line and staff offices. Uh, and um, so this is going to be one of those metrics that we're going to have to uh, deal with, and it's going to be a challenge. Uh, I recognize that, um, but it's very important to me and to other senior leadership in NOAA that this is done consistently across the board, and there, there are not haves and have-nots. Because where you get have and have-nots, honestly, you get people jumping ship. Either they leave NOAA or they just go to another part of NOAA that is more flexible. We don't want to compete with ourselves. Uh, and uh, again, we're trying to create an environment where everyone's happy. So uh, we recognize this as an issue and we're trying to address it. Thank you. The next one is a question about how serious we are about environmental justice. If there's any yes, and as I that. said, this is part of the racial equity discussion. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I have spent a lot of time and effort over the last few years on diversity and inclusion issues internal to NOAA. I have not spent a lot of focus on the social, social justice issues. And that's really what um, the Biden administration and the new political team is bringing to the table. They are very very focused on this issue. I've had multiple conversations with them. I know they're talking to others within NOAA and Commerce about these issues. Uh, again, we have a working group that's trying to identify uh, where our services uh, can are, be provided uh, in, in, in a fashion to make sure that we're uh, representing all communities across the entire country in an equal way. So this is, this is really a hot topic, and, and it's something that excites me because, again, it has not been a large focus of mine in the past. I've been more, you know, putting all my time and effort internally in NOAA. Uh, let me say this, too. That those, I also recognize those two things are combined. If we don't have diversity within NOAA, uh, then it's going to be harder for us to spar, spot and focus our efforts on social justice issues. So these two things go hand in hand. Um, but I, I, I'm really enthused by the focus on, on these issues, particularly when it comes to our services, climate, weather, and other emergency services across the country, making sure that all communities are getting our data and using our data. Um, it, it's a big issue, and, and I know it's, we're, we're starting to address it. Thank you. I'm going to combine a couple that have similar uh, topics here. Um, they'd like to know what uh, leadership is doing to adapt operations and research to climate change and um, 
and sharing that mitigation amongst uh, amongst the yeah. so, you know, agency um, as a whole? It's a good question. Uh, I, I can tell you, um, and uh, uh, I will. I'll call out uh, Nicole LaBoff, who's uh, the acting head of the National Ocean Service, as a huge champion for this. Um, we at NOAA, uh, and we we have not always done this. My experience is we not always done this, always done this. We need to be a not model to the world on this issue. We need to make sure our facilities, the way we work, the way we operate, uh, is uh, it focuses on climate change and our carbon footprint. We have not always done a good job of doing that. We have a lot of outdated facilities um, that uh, are not efficient. And we're actually having this conversation at a very high level. Uh, I just had this conversation with the Department of, uh, of Commerce yesterday, the political leadership up there, about improving our facilities and getting Congress on board to support our facility efforts um, to, to get better, newer, more efficient facilities that are placed in, uh, going back to the social justice area uh, in question, placed in areas uh, that are in all communities across the country. So um, again, another one of those topics uh, that is a big issue within NOAA a uh, lot of conversation about it and how we can do better. Um, and uh, I, I would tell you sometimes these things are grassroots. Uh, the Ocean Service has uh, started working aggressively on these issues, even in small ways, recycling them in small ways. Um, and we're starting to use some of those efforts uh, throughout NOAA. And again, my goal, and I know a lot of the leadership's goal, is to be the leader in this. We aren't right now. I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, and because we, our footprint is just way too large, but we're working on it. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, um, will it be permanent positions to address racial equity, um, ensure the work is sustainable, and then on that same note, what are we doing to update our archaic hiring system USA jobs. Okay, so um, on that first perfect. issue, um, the diversity and inclusion strategic plan that was issued by the Office of Inclusion and Civil Rights last year is close to, is completely connected to this action plan I described. And one of the goals, one of the three major goals of the strategic plan is sustainability. We fully recognize that sometimes these things are flashes in the pan. Uh, hey, there's an immediate effort, and then when things die down, okay, it's ignored. So we are, what we're trying to do is place things within processes and procedures, whether it's in the way we hire, whether it's in uh, who we have on hiring panels, whether it's in the way we do internship programs. We're trying to make it part of the process uh, with annual reviews and metrics to make sure we're doing things right so that there is sustainability, that it's not just one-time efforts, we're actually continuing. We do not, I mean, so on the racial equity front, the Office of Inclusion and Civil Rights, which is headed by Kenny Bailey, they uh, are at the forefront of this. Uh, and if you say, do we have anyone hired full-time, we have an organization that's hired full-time to address this. I, I'll be perfectly honest with you, they are stretched extraordinarily thin. And we are trying to get them more resources to do their jobs and to, to uh, start addressing a lot more of these issues. As far as hiring goes, I think I mentioned um, recruitment is a major issue for us. And we are starting to look at USA Jobs. I mentioned it as one of our efforts, uh, midterm efforts, to start making sure that the, the announcements go out uh, are, one, appropriate, two, are targeted to certain communities uh, where we have underrepresented groups. Um, and so uh, absolutely, that's, that, that, that's an important part of what we're focused on. I'm going to combine another two for you since they're similar topics. Um, is there talk of including neurodiverse individuals and individuals from the disabled community within inter internships and NOAA in general? And then also, will the diversity efforts include older workers? 
such as creating a path that allows contractors okay. to more um, easily transfer. A couple different issues there. One is on how we target uh, underrepresented communities. I think that's how I read it. Um, and uh, Louisa Koch and uh, Sean Clayton, Louisa is the head of our uh, Office of Education, uh, Sean Clayton, who's head of our Human Resources Group, they're working together on this, and it is a, a part of our action plan. Uh, we do have the Educational Partnership Program, which is a longstanding program where we work with uh, colleges and universities across the country uh, that are minority-serving institutions. We spend a lot of money um, on them. We bring in interns, mandatory interns now, into uh, the NOAA fold. And we are working hard to try to create a pipeline from these universities directly into NOAA. Historically, we've, we've struggled with that uh, because, uh, frankly, we haven't had a hiring we haven't had the hiring ability to do it. And so we are spending money on scholarships and training these great folks who go out to the private sector or academia or elsewhere. We're not getting them into NOAA. So we've really been focused on this. As I mentioned, we have new legislative authorities that allow us to do direct hire, and we're trying to do basically a pipeline where we can uh, get interns in from some of these minority-serving institutions and in areas where we desperately need diversity, um, and also just great scientists and engineers, uh, and bring them on as interns, try to get them offers even before they graduate, and just bring them into the fold quickly. Uh, so that's some of the efforts going on there. Uh, as for the contract force, that is a larger issue, and I know the contract, you know, historically, uh, we get a lot of our permanent employees through the contract force. Uh, it's like, you know, there's no easy way into NOAA. Uh, a lot of times you have to get that experience as a contractor before we can finally get you in the door. Uh, this is an area that, um, you know, remains a challenge. Uh, part of it, uh, I'll be blunt, is just the way the personnel system works and the priorities that have to be given on applicants when they apply uh, to NOAA. The direct hire authority helps with some of that, but it does not help with contractors. I will say the one area that we did get uh, recent legislation for was to make it easier for the NOAA Corps uh, individuals who are, are leaving uh, the NOAA Corps to be hired directly by NOAA. And for those who don't know the NOAA Corps, the NOAA Corps is a uniform branch uh, of the Armed Forces that works with NOAA that operates our ships and planes. Uh, they bring a wealth of experience. Uh, they're extraordinarily talented. And we've struggled to get them hired within NOAA after they leave their service. Uh, and we have new legislation that, makes, that facilitates that. Here's another good one. Given the stress on climate change in one NOAA, is there a push for more positions that are co-funded by multiple line offices? Um, you know, I such think as everything is on the table at this point. Uh, I'm going to be very interested to see our FY21 budget. Uh, and hopefully, we get support for climate and climate change uh, in that budget, uh, where we can hire more individuals um, to focus on some of these issues. I can tell you. Uh, and I, I mean, I sit uh, almost daily with the assistant administrators, the head of the weather service, ocean service, satellite service, fishery service, research service, OMAO. I, I sit, I talk to them constantly. And they will all tell you that there has never been a tighter connection with NOAA on these issues. And it's because we are being forced with dealing with climate change as one NOAA as a whole. And I have sent this message again and again. The only way we fail here is if we divide. If we come together, like I said, we can do this. We got this. So right now, there are a lot of councils and committees that are cross-line offices. The Weather, Water, Climate Board is one of many examples. Uh, we're going to continue working in those. And I am open to all and any suggestions about cross-line efforts uh, to make sure we are working as one NOAA on this huge, enormous problem uh, that, that we are dealing with on behalf of the country. This one is similar, has some uh, similarities. Uh, would it be possible to have an office specifically for outreach? Um, how can we partner with other federal agencies? Yeah, you know, so, OK. I'll be honest with you. Um, I've been wanting something like this for a long time. Uh, 
and it's not just there. Uh, one of my biggest frustrations uh, at NOAA is that as amazing an agency as we are, there's large parts of the population that don't know who we are and what we do, and that impacts everything. It impacts our recruiting abilities. It impacts our budget asks from Congress. It impacts the support we get from the public. Um, and so I have been pushing for a very long time on getting uh, more work done on branding and uh, getting our name out there, name recognition out there. Right now, we rely on a, a number of different sources to do that. Our communications office does some of that. Uh, our Office of Education does a lot of that. Um, I'm hoping to expand those services. Uh, and uh, certainly, it is a big issue, because if people don't know exist and what we do, um, it's very hard to get them on board and, and to back us up. So uh, yes, we are looking at that issue. Uh, I don't have an immediate answer for you. Um, but it, it's something that's definitely high on the priority list. Next question is, post-COVID, will have a lot of relation, relationships to reestablish and new ones to form. Being in person is important. How do you see NOAA supporting this need um, with the, yeah. the idea that... So uh, we are in a brand new world here. I, I mean, we just are. And we are getting a lot of very smart people together to think through these issues and to talk to other agencies and experts to figure this out. It is not easy to solve, and we all recognize that. Um, we don't want to, you know, solve one problem and create another. I 100% agree with you. Personally, I am not somebody who likes to telework. I have always loved going into the office. Uh, you know, I, I telework about once a year, typically, when I have something big to write. You know, other, other than that, I like going into the office. I like being around other people. And I feel like there's great collaboration and networking that happens with that. So we don't want to give that up. But at the same time, we have to recognize we're in a new world. And we, there is a lot that you can do virtually, and more and more is being done virtually. I can tell you that you know, some of the larger companies that have gone all virtual have ultimately gone back to going into the office, at least partially, because they've realized that they miss out too much by going all virtual. We don't have the capacity to go all virtual, and we never will. However, um, we're trying to find the right balance, the right balance between um, giving people flexibility that they want and need, reducing our carbon footprint, saving on facilities, but also getting people interaction. So we have to come up with, I think, with some creative ways to do that. We would, if, if we can reduce our, our footprint, we would see some savings and we could put some money towards that. For example, uh, I know there's been a big push. Uh, you know, uh, our scientists want to go to conferences. They want to go to, to meetings and work in collaboration with other scientists. Uh, potentially, we could do more of that um, if we could save on facilities. Uh, we're looking at new technical uh, ways of dealing with collaboration. And ultimately, um, we're, we're not going to try to force anybody into one setting or another. If people want to come into the office, we're hoping to do that and have the, those opportunities. Likely, what we're going to see is, let's say people want to telework more, instead of having everyone having an own office, for example, We'll have joint hoteling space so that folks can, uh, you know, that are maybe teleworking more than half their time uh, when they work in the office uh, or maybe in a shared space or in a communal space that they can work together. That's something, for example, NASA is pushing for and that's something they're working on. But we're all in this together. We're all trying to solve these problems together. There's a lot of questions and issues. And I promise you, we're not going to get it right the first time around. So we're going to have to stay flexible and open as we move forward. All right, due to time, I think this one might be our last question. Um, where'd it go? Oh, there we go. What are we doing to bring accountability to supervisors who do not support the initiatives of diversity and inclusion? What are the tools? Yeah. What tools do the workforce? I, I can tell you, and, and I'll just, I'll just 
be honest here. You know, we are a wide reaching organization that, that's all over the country. Um, I'll be honest here. On the, when we got the survey responses, I was shocked to see they, they were anonymous. Everything was anonymous. There were, there were responses in there that shocked me and they were unsettling. And it's clear that not everyone in this organization agrees with our, our diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, so I, I, all I can tell you is this, that uh, we have zero tolerance for those kinds of attitudes. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, are trying to uh, reach out across all of NOAA to provide um, uh, support for those that feel like they're facing a hostile work environment. Any claims of uh, disparity or where you're seeing problems, I urge you to report it through um, the Office of Inclusion and Civil Rights. Uh, or uh, if you're not comfortable with your immediate supervisor, uh, report it up the chain. I can promise you that if somebody reports to me or to a, an AA or a DAA or a staff office director or other senior leadership, that somebody is not taking these efforts seriously, we are going to act quickly and swiftly. It's simply unacceptable. And, uh, and we recognize that there's still some of these attitudes out there. Uh, and, and we will do everything in our power to stop it. So um, I'm not asking you to inundate my inbox, but I, what I am saying is this. We're trying to provide the resources um, to put out there. Uh, let me uh, to, to support you. And where we hear about this, we are going to try to root it out. Uh, let me also say that um, one of the short-term things that we have, and uh, this has never stopped, the survey we did for the entire workforce, there is an open inbox right now that anybody can provide continuing comments and issues to. Um, and you, it's anonymous, unless you want to identify yourself. Uh, and you can, you can submit things to, uh, to that inbox. And uh, we will review it, and uh, and if we can, uh, you know, we, we will take action. Thanks, our speaker Benjamin Friedman, for presenting today, and the NOAA staff and captioner for making this webinar possible. Our next seminar in the NOAA Environmental Leadership Series will be on Tuesday, March 9th, so next week. Oh, uh, not next week. Oh, no, yes, next week. Sorry, everyone. At 2 p.m. featuring Dr. Jason Link, Senior Scientist for Ecosystem Management at NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service Office. And the title for his presentation is 10 Ocean Processes. And we hope that you will attend. Goodbye, everyone. Thank, and thank you for everyone. joining us.